Brothers and sisters, welcome to CMJ Canada, our Bible study on the Parashat Shavua, the actual the Haftorah, Haftara portions uh, of of uh, Toldot and uh, Vayatse. So we're, we're in the book of Genesis, and uh, our heroes are um, getting married, fleeing, and having children, and we're discovering that God has uh, an affinity for still working with dysfunctional families. Isn't that a blessing? <laughs> so, and then the 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 the, the Haftarah portions are from the prophets. So previously we had had the voice of kings and say history now we actually get the voice the prophetic voice speaking again from malachi and uh hosea hoshia let's is a sacred time that is it's time in the presence of the lord dedicated to studying and reading his word so let's pray this is a tradition that we do um, father in heaven we bless your name your your name is great and we would ask once again that you would guard and defend your name in this in this situation you'll defend your name against evil you'll defend your name against disrepute you will defend your people and your land and uh, you'll defend us and uh, and you'll defend the truth we ask this most humbly in the name of our risen messiah jesus of nazareth amen all right so the first torah portion now just just to give a brief overview of the torah portion so we understand its connections to the haftarah uh, is Toldot, which is um, uh, starting in Genesis, Genesis 25, and uh, it's the uh, the the generations. It, uh, genealogies are quite are quite big uh, in the in in the Bible, and um, the God told Abraham that he was going to be blessed. And what was he going to be blessed with? He was going to be blessed with children and descendants. But then what we discover is that just about every one of the matriarchs is um, is, is, is infertile and, and has trouble getting pregnant. And you think, hang on a second, how does that work? You promised that you would give a blessing and that blessing would be fertility. And yet what we find is all the, the women come along and they're infertile. So you scratch your head and you've got to start thinking, what am I possibly learning in this? And so there's this idea of patience. There's an, definitely an idea of trust, particularly when things seem so against you, right? You know, you've got a divine voice saying you're going to be fruitful and multiply, and then that the opposite happens. So now what do you do? Do you start to doubt yourself? Well, I didn't really hear the voice right. God isn't true. I'm doing something wrong. You know, you could, there's all these things that are probably coming in, and I bet we have all gone through that. And of course, the patriarchs have done that before us. And so what we see is, as they've done this, is time doesn't work the way I want it. It just doesn't. Okay? Um the uh, interestingly enough is uh, in this por in in the previous portion, Abraham is the first person to get old. I think we discussed this last time. Abraham who's a Ken. Right? He's the first person in the Bible to get old. But, um, what does he do? He gets married again and he finds a wife for Isaac. So he, the uh, the 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 what we're learning from this is even if you're old, you can still add to the world. There's no such thing as I'm old and therefore I'll just sit around and, and, uh, and the young will now you know, do everything. Actually, right, Abraham gets old and he has more kids than he had before, finds a wife for Isaac. And uh, unfortunately, the wife that we find is barren. Not that he probably knew that at that time, okay? But uh, but but Isaac and Rebecca, they um, they uh, they they have a problem. Uh, they are forty years old when they get married, but they're going to be sixty when they have their first kid. So for twenty years, twenty years, um, Isaac is unable uh, to give Rebecca children, and um, uh, the uh, 
the they, they really had to wait. Now Isaac is an interesting character in the in the in the text. One, he's only got four chapters that are ascribed to him. Okay, it's not big. Um, uh, he doesn't do much in terms of well, he doesn't he doesn't lead uh, 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 armies in international politics like Abraham. Um, he doesn't have a plethora of kids like Jacob. Um, you know, he doesn't, doesn't really do a heck of a lot per se. Okay. Um, but what does he do? He doesn't change his name. Okay? There's no name change in this character. There's no need for him to have a name change. And he never leaves the land of Israel. Right? He, there's, there, he doesn't wander away. He doesn't get kicked out. Um, so there's there's something about him and the land, something about him uh, and his his uh, and his faithfulness, despite the fact that he doesn't seem to um, do a heck of a lot. But uh, in Toldot, um, it, it's got one of my favorite verses in all of Genesis, okay? And it's uh, Genesis 26, verse 5. Now, I know uh, we've discussed this one before, but we will read it again. And uh, so 26, verse 5, this is where... Abraham's now finally gotten so old that he actually did, really did die. Um, and God starts talking to Isaac. Okay. And uh, God, in his discussions with Isaac, he says um, in verse four, I'm going to multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. I'm going to give, which is kind of interesting because he ends up only having two kids, right? His wife gets pregnant once, produces two kids, and that's it. But unlike uh, Jacob, there's no need for concubines. Okay, Abraham's got a plethora of concubines, right? But but Isaac, no. So he's an interesting character, isn't he? Doesn't change his name, doesn't leave the land, only has one wife. Very rare for a hero of God. Uh, I'm going to multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. I'm going to give your descendants these lands. The, there's a, the commitment to God and his people always involves this territory. And, uh, and by your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That includes sunny Canada, as all the other nations, and Egypt, and Jordan, right? And Lebanon, they're supposed to be blessed too. Syria is supposed to be blessed because of this too. And I think that's one of the reasons why the prophets will always eventually give you that beautiful moment where the Egyptians and the Assyrians will worship God. How's it going to happen? No clue. Because when you look at the, the mess that we're in right now, you think, come on, how's this going to work, Lord? But it is the prophetic call. All nations will be blessed. And that includes the white guys, right? Okay, All right. as as well, um, by your descendants. Why? Well, because I said so. Well, but, but, but God puts a, uh, an attachment to this. Because Abraham obeyed, he obeyed me, he kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws, right? There are four things that uh, Abraham does. So the blessing of God, even though it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a gift, right? God gives a gift, but then it's still conditional to, to obedience. And that's that theology is picked up in the New Testament. You know this, and I know this. It's a tough one, but it's true. Um, when I had a group from Shoresh, CMJ Australia, had brought a brought a, um, a group through Shoresh, then I was giving them a series of lectures, always a dangerous thing to do, to make, make me give you lectures. Uh, and uh, as I was giving a talk, one lady took very great offense at some of the things I was saying because I was discussing, and you already know this, I was discussing that faith, emuna, is a verb. That faith is something that you do. It's not just something that you believe. And so she immediately quoted Mark 16 at me, which is um, uh, if you confess, uh, no, Romans, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you're saved. I'm like, oh, fantastic. Just say Jesus is Lord, believe it, and you're done. I was like, excellent, nice verse. But of course, we in the Christian world have this thing called the, you know, the whole counsel of God. 
in, um, in, in, in the Jewish world, they just called it the Bible, but the whole counsel of God. And, uh, and in Mark 16, it says, if you believe and are baptized, you'll be saved. So now you actually got to add something. You can't just confess with your mouth. You can't just believe with your heart. Now you've actually got to get baptized. Then Hebrews uh, 5, 9 comes along and says, Jesus has become the source of eternal salvation to all who obey. So as you suddenly realize, it's not just simply Jesus is Lord. Now there's a, there's a whole gambit of things. And, uh, and so God has told Abraham, you're going to be a blessing to the nations, and yet it's still contingent upon his obedience. And so God says here in Genesis 26, verse 5, which is told that I'm going to continue my faithfulness to you because your, your father obeyed. And not, what did he obey? He obeyed a whole bunch of things. He obeyed God's laws, Torah, plural. Right, exactly what we're talking about. No one has a clue because we haven't given the Torah yet. So people are, are challenge me sometimes, and it's great to get challenged. Aaron, how can you possibly obey the Torah? And I was like, well, the same way Abraham did. That's how I'm going to do it, and that's how you're going to do it too. The same way Abraham did, because we are sons of Abraham, and uh, and that's by faith. And uh, being and by by being grafted in, so that's the the, uh, the scenario there. The kids that come out, well, you know them, Jacob and Esau, and they're going to play out in the Torah in the Haftarah portion, which we will have to discuss during discussion time. Uh, Jacob is the great deceiver, as you know. He he tricks uh, his father into giving um, a blessing, and blessings are real. Um, you know that, right? God gives us blessings, so they're obviously real. So you would never say a blessing from God is not real. It's real. And uh, people give each other blessings. And the, in the in the Bible, those were sought over, and those weren't. You did not give a blessing every day, like we do today. We meet people, and say, oh, the Lord bless you, and you know, bless you, and I'm going to bless you. Uh, in in the ancient world, it, it was something you held on to. And you didn't give them away freely. And so um, the, 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 the father was to give a blessing on his deathbed or towards the end of his life. And that had real value and real impact in the world and in the future. And then one of the other strange things that humans can do is we can bless God, which you see Jewish people doing all the time. They turn every common moment and turn around and bless the Lord for it. They turn something common, make it into do something sacred. But the deceiver runs away, and then later on is himself deceived, because as the uh, the Jewish commentary will we'll, we'll play, meida uh, keneged meida, measure for measure. Okay, you reap what you sow. Uh, live by the sword, die by the sword. Jacob engages in deception. He himself is then later going to be deceived and he's then going to end up with Leah instead of the, the lady he wants. Get her to eventually, but but Leah um, will, will go first. But the Haftara passage for, uh, for the for Toldot is the prophet Malachi. And uh, uh, people like Malachi, one, one because um, they always make the joke that he's our Italian prophet. Malachi, but uh, my servant, my my angel, you know, however you want to you know, you want to say it, uh, Malachi is is a very uh, one of the later prophets, and um, uh, he has something interesting to say. You end up with um, uh, the, a word of the Lord uh, to Israel through through Malachi, um, a prophecy. Now, exactly the scenario of when he's giving it isn't, isn't listed down per se. Um, notice that it's a word of the Lord. Uh, uh, Malachi isn't infused by the Spirit. Only two prophets in the entire Bible actually have the Spirit of God on them. Uh, and you know who they are? Elijah and Elisha. And they don't write books. Right? 
And, uh, and so when Jesus is giving his sermon in Luke 4, he quotes two prophets when he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then during his sermon, he says, like Elijah and Elisha, okay, the other prophets who have the Holy Spirit. Everybody else gets a vision or an oracle or, or a, a prophecy, but the spirit is, is, is something else. And those that get the spirit don't write books, which is also very interesting, okay? Um, but here you have the literary prophet. So what does he, what does he say? Okay. So first of all, he says, I have loved you, says the Lord. Right? So the first thing that the prophet does, or that, the, the, that God is going to actually address through the prophet, is he's going to remind them that God loves them. So before I rebuke you, before I tell you, you Israel, how bad you are and what you've done, I just want you to know that I actually really do love you. Okay? So your God ground puts the, the the foundation first by saying, I, I I'm in I'm actually in love with you, which is the reason why I'm doing this in the first place. Okay. And then of course the response is, Well, how have you loved us? Right? It's sort of, um sort of a bit of an ignorant um uh reply but also one of a challenge. Right? If God loves me, then why does all this rubbish happen? Right? Okay, that's what that's what skeptics will always challenge us on. And for, unfortunately for the Jewish people, they've asked themselves that question many, many times. If we are the chosen people, then why does this stuff keep happening to us? Right? If God really, really protects us remember like everybody now i'm going to tell you something i really value your prayers of protection for micah really do and a lot of people have sent me messages like a lot praying you know psalm 83 91 you know you pick a pick one over micah over micah over micah it's like uh, that's fantastic but remember the same psalm that says the lord watches over israel he neither slumbers or sleeps that's the same guy that let october the 7th happen Right? You've got to remember, you've got to keep it into, into perspective. So when, when God turns around and says, I love you, and the people respond, well, how? You know, you love me? Well, what happened to mom and dad? They got, they got killed. So that, you know, people can have a, a, a faith crisis when, when bad things happen, and that's when you've got to step in. That's when you've got to get in there and say, I hear you. Don't, 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 don't lose faith over this one. Let's try and see how God is still working in this situation. Uh, let's see what God is going to do and why is, is, are these things happening. And so uh, uh, they're big deals, they're, they're, and they're right up front. They're, they're not ignored by the Bible. Okay, And um, uh, we all have to uh, bear the brunt of, of this question for ourselves as well, okay? because all of us have some sort of history, whether it's going to be national, uh, a part of a nation, or whether it's going to be part of a family, or just, just things within our own family circles where you sometimes go, where was God when that happened? Why does God allow this to happen? I don't quite understand. And so there's a, a big, big effort of faith. Maybe Isaac asked that question for 20 years while his wife didn't have any kids. You know, we're, we're, you know, God doesn't seem to be answering my prayers. Uh, even though he's, oh, he's God, he promised my dad that we would be uh, fruitful, and um, but nothing seems to be happening. So, uh, so it's it's not always easy. So, um, verse verse three. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? And this is probably why this Torah, Haftarah passage is linked to the Torah portion, because, of course, Isaac, uh, Isaac has Esau and uh, Jacob. And uh, because they're mentioned here as part of the prophetic tradition, gets put into um, our portion to study. Um, was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob. But Esau I have hated, and have turned his hill country into a wasteland, and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Like, oof, that's a tough one. Uh, so we may as well deal with it. And I'm um, looking forward to hearing some of your comments now.
Um, the protagonists are Jacob and Esau as, as characters uh, that the prophet is using to describe um, Israel's plight. And, um, and uh, God has made a choice between two brothers. And that's not always an easy thing for us to, to wrestle with. Okay, and uh, so we have a choice between these two brothers. It's always easy to, to wrestle with or fathom. Some commentaries will say, Jacob I loved and Esau I loved less. Right, you know, try and say it in a nice way. I still loved Esau, but just not as much. Okay, um, or uh, I know that some of the people here will, will, try, will say, you know, try and, and use it in terms of like a preferredness. Uh, Jacob, I preferred, and Esau, I, I didn't prefer, um, and all kinds of things. How, uh, uh, and that, that's nice. However, the literal Hebrew is, I hated. Okay, that's just it. Okay, There's, you can't, you can say whatever you like, but the, the word is Esau, Shaneti. Esau, I hated. Okay, that's, and, and that same word is for, I hate sin, or I hate this. Okay, There's, it's, a, it's strong. We have to deal with it. It's in the text. Don't ignore it. Don't try and run away with it. Just have to deal with it. So um, now, once again, just like the verse where, you know, in Romans, um, it, it's say, say Jesus is Lord and believe you're fine. In Mark, believe and be baptized. In Hebrews, obey. Okay? There's more in the story. So we continue. Uh, Edom says, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord says. They may build, but I'll demolish. They may call the wicked land. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of God. You will see it with your own eyes. Great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. And so uh, they're going to come back. Uh, okay. Uh, what was the is a question? Does hate eliminate love okay um can you love someone you hate or here's a here's a, that's a good question so here's how i would approach it and um often we we see that love uh, we, we we think that love um and hate are opposites I don't think that that's true. I think hate is a um, distortion of love. I think this is direct opposite. Do you know what I think is the actual opposite of love? Complete indifference, which is where the world is. The love of many has grown cold. That people just don't care and you look in the bible and god says i can't stand people who sit on the fence you know, go one way or the other you know um and uh, and so i think that uh i don't think that love and hate are like direct polar opposites you know um i think that there's something i think they're a bit more closer actually um, um that doesn't mean that, that that's good um but but i think that the real true true opposite of love is just indifference. People just don't care anymore, and um, and uh, and and that's the way the world is going. I think what you're seeing is people, you know, they'll they'll film things go wrong and post it on YouTube, but they won't bother to go help. And uh, you know, and 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 people will get angry and they'll do a few clicks on social media and then never leave their house to do anything. Just complete bystander indifference. Now where we're up to. And we're allowing evil people to have the rule of the roost. I think that's um, pretty bad. All right, but uh, what what the prophet does here in his um, in his opening chapter uh, is set out that there is a choice. God has made a choice, and He has chosen Jacob. And that doesn't mean that uh, Esau isn't doesn't have his own blessings okay because he does right um actually he does have he does have some blessings 
Um, the the prophet actually now turns around and has a go internally at uh, the children of Israel's priestly system, basically bad shepherds, okay, which is uh, one of the big problems that you have in uh, the church universal, that you pick a denomination, we've got problems, and also um, uh, non-churchy priests, the, the, the leadership of our day. The son on, on is his father, slave is master. If I'm a father, where's the honor due me? If I'm a master, where's the respect, says the Lord? It is you priests who show contempt for my name. So the very people who should actually be um, uh, um, making the name of the Lord God great through their worship, through their lifestyle, through their teaching the truth, they can't do it. And so God has a rebuke on them. Um, and uh, even though he's turned around and said, guys, I chose you and look what you've done for me. Right? And um, and that's not fair. So, uh, and, and you ask, how have we shown contempt? By offering defiled food. Right? And how did you do it? Um, you offer blind animals for sacrifices. Okay. Um, so basically not giving God the best. Now, the, 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 the Bible is pretty clear on how you're supposed to worship the Lord. Funny thing is, um, even though you get given a direction from from God, still don't like doing it. Um, uh, it's a it's a human condition. You know, this is the way we should obey the Lord. You know, um, this church in this church, you must wear hats in churches. And people walk in. I deliberately won't wear a hat because I'm an individual. You think, oh, for crying out loud! Okay, you just you know, go to another church that doesn't have hats. But um, here you've got. Uh, uh, the temple of God, and you're supposed to give God the best. And instead, people were trying to trick God, uh, still undergo the form and function, still saying prayers, still believing that there is a God, and, and still doing things. And people do this in, in, our own, in our own lifestyle. Okay, let's take this personally. Okay, um, we all believe in the Lord. Yeah, we all believe that there's, uh, we believe that God is, is his hand on, on us, on our families, on Israel, on the nations, etc. Uh, and yet, will we give God our best or something else? And uh, so this is a, a little rebuke, perhaps probably, uh, of our own. And so um, what should they, what should, um, what should the priests do? Well, basically God says, you know, just um, uh, um, return to good preaching. Return to honest worship. Return to uh, loving the poor and the, and the and the widow and the orphan. Basically, return. Uh, return to doing good and preaching the truth. And this should be a call across the board. You know, what should we want our pastors to do? Just simply start preaching the truth. And uh, that and, and how hard can that be? Well, apparently it's pretty hard because. You know, they continue to fail at this, um, but uh, but it really should be the all all congregations should be challenging their pastors to saying, listen, um, you know, whenever they have their little meetings and they you know, pastors are like, so what would you like, guys? And people should stick their hand up, uh, start preaching the truth, will you? Otherwise, you're fired. Next time we meet, you're done. You know, um, but uh, that's not, we don't seem to we don't seem to have a a standard for our pastors anymore, and they um. Which, which is a real shame. I think I could be completely wrong, but I'd love to hear your opinions. When we when we come to have a chat, what do you think of Jacob and Esau? And why is the the, the prophet Malachi uh, bringing this up when, he's, when he then immediately turns around and rebukes Jacob? Okay. So uh, the last couple of verses of, of 2 to 7, uh, chapter 2, 1 to 7, uh, just continuing um, um, Malachi's dig uh, at the priests. Now, remember, the, in the New Testament, teachers um, don't get off easy either. Right? You know, when, you, when you get into the epistles, uh, James particularly has some harsh warnings for teachers and people who purport to teach uh, the truth. So quickly... Um, the Lord says he's, says he's going to send a curse 
uh, on the people. That's horrible. Um, and uh, and I'll rebuke your descendants. So there's actually a the 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 things that we do. Remember, carry on into the future. Okay, blessings and curses. And then, so therefore, we have a real responsibility, not just for ourselves, but for the generations that are coming after us. Um, we we often don't think that way. We often don't think in in long terms. Um, some nations do. So, some some people groups think quite long uh, in, in in terms. But we're in we're into a situation right now. I've got a feeling that most people can't even think beyond next week. But uh, but but in Western culture, we we have a tendency not to think of the the future generations, other than let's send our kids to school and they might learn something and they might get a job and get a house and then that's it. But really, what about building the nation? What about um, um, curing cancer? You know, what about doing something that actually goes beyond ourselves and our, and our and our um, and our families? And uh, and so here is this with God saying. You know, it's not just what you're doing to yourselves, but it's going to lay up for your for your descendants as well. And um, uh, the the um, Mike the the in verse four, God says, uh, "I will. I know that I have sent you a warning, for my covenant is with Levi." It's very interesting that uh, he uses this. Uh, uh, a tribe because he's talking to priests my covenant was with him uh, a covenant of life and peace but they're always going to be priests for for god uh i gave this to him uh, this is called a reverence and he has revered me and he stood in my name this is what priests are supposed to be doing they're supposed to be standing in, in, in not in the place of god but a, but in, in in a place where that leads people to god true instruction was on his mouth Right? Nothing false was found on his lips. Okay, and that's what God wants from his from his clergy or, or all the people. And that includes us, by the way. If we're going to be a kingdom of priests, you can apply that to yourself as well. But for our shepherds at least. So that's uh that's the um the 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 prophetic portion which takes uh, a look at Jacob and Esau. Um, from the from the Torah por- from the huff- from the Torah portion, and then immediately has um, a rebuke of our clergy. And um, well, let's be honest, that would be very true of today as well. The uh, the next portion, they yet say, so Jacob leaves and uh, the tour portion starts um they had say yakov mebersheva the yelech harama so jacob goes out from beersheva and uh, what does he go out from would be a classic jewish question and rabbis can spend hours trying to come up with what does he go out from he can't just simply go out from beersheva and he's got a, what is he leaving? Is he leaving a place of security? Is he leaving um, peace? Is he leaving his? He's leaving his family home. Is he? Is he abandoning uh, tradition? They they think long and deep about what is he leaving, and uh, he heads towards Haram, uh, Haran, and uh, in English, the next verse says he came to a certain place. And he spent the night there because the sun had set and he took one of the stones of the place, put it under his head. He lay down. So here's what it says in the Hebrew. Vayifna the makom, which means, and the place struck him. It means he was hit by the place. Okay, what, a, what an interesting thing to say, right? Um, he was running and then something happens like whack. The, the place just, he was struck by wherever he was yeah he stopped fell over he did something happen and um and uh well, then what he does is in the place he decides to rest via sheba makomho and he decides to sit in that place and um and he dreams and there there was a, a ladder but before he does it it says the yikach 
and he took the stones of the place. Right? So he it's it's in plural. And um and then later on in uh in verse uh nineteen it says um that he took the stone. So in verse eighteen, sorry, so Jacob Jacob rose early and he took the stone that was his pillar. So lots of stones have become one stone. And uh, which is a very interesting little thing, and they have a little interesting midrash where um, Jacob um, uh, comes to this place, which today is called Beit El, and Beit El is situated on the other side of the Mount of Olives, uh, not too far from Jerusalem. Where um, and you can go and visit there. There's actually a, a um, very nice kibbutz there. That's a, a religious kibbutz. Uh, and it has a uh, we've we've prayed there. Uh, Melody, we did the north, south, east, west. The great tower, and um, there's this field where um, uh, Jeroboam built a temple and uh, and uh, and a palace, and he had an altar to a, a pagan to his idol. But um, the there's a midrash that says that uh, Jacob found the place or was struck by the place something happened that caused him to stay there and when he was deciding to sleep all the stones started shouting pick me pick me pick me you need to pick me because i'm just a great stone for you to rest your head on and uh, um, essentially heaven came down and went what is this noise okay shut up and got all the stones together and melded them together into one stone Okay, and uh, so when you go, when you actually go to Beit El, you actually see this flat stone that looks like it's had some sort of heat thing happen to it. Probably some geological event that make this that's melded all the stones together. Um, so it's an interesting little midrash which is played up in a piece of archaeology when you go and have a look. Now whether that's the stone, and that's what they'll say when you go there, they'll say that's the stone that the, the our patriarch uh, slept on good as place as any. Um, okay, I mean everybody decided to build a church on this thing. There's a crusader church. There's a a, a, a Mamluk um, a mosque there. There's um, Israelite stuff, and there's a, a thousand year old oak tree. Why not need one of those um, in the area? But this is where apparently um, Jacob has his dream. And he sees the ladder, and there are. And this again just comes into a Jewish tradition where there's parts of heaven and earth that are really, really close, and uh, and and parts of the planet where it's that they're, they're really close, and they're so close that you can that you can move from one side to the other, and so Jacob sees the dream. And he sees the ladder and the angels are going up and down. Of course, we've done the question before. If angels are ascending and descending, where do they start from? They don't start from heaven. They start from earth. They're, they're doing a job on the planet. Uh, and uh, and he realizes that he's in a very special special place. So he names the place Beit El. Of course, there is also a Jewish tradition that says that has to have been the Temple Mountain. There's no way that that could be somewhere else so there's there is there are there are streams within jewish exegesis some put it at a place called Beit el and some put it on top of um the temple mountain of the house of god so it take your pick doesn't actually really really matter um then when you get to to haran jacob the great deceiver is himself deceived and he unfortunately um uh, gets tricked into marrying Leah. There is a different midrashim as to how that happens um, and who allows it. And uh, the uh, one tradition is Rachel does it. Is uh, Rachel herself knows that she's being tricked and refuses to talk. So she could have spilt the beans, but she decides no. Um. 
going to let God have control. And, uh, you know, she submits to the will of God and, uh, and then sees her sister marry the beloved instead. Um, That's very nice of her. Um, people in Jewish tradition and, and in many Christian exegetical traditions too, we've got a real fondness for Rachel. Uh, you know, Jacob loves her and she's really nice and doesn't have a lot of kids and you know, really prays hard, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we often miss a couple of things. So one, it's Leah who actually produces Judah, who actually produces the house of King David, who actually produces the Messiah. So out of all the women, okay, Rachel, okay, Leah is the one. And there's a great midrash which discusses how wonderful she is. Okay, so here's another little story. What's a, what's a midrash I hear you ask? Remember, completely not true. All right, but but tells the truth. So <clears throat> Leah uh, has had six boys, right? That's how many she had. And Bilha and Zipha, right, they get two each. So there's 10. And so Leah discovers she's pregnant again, child number seven. And Leah goes to have a chat with God. And Leah says, listen, HaKodesh Baruch Hu, you know, the Almighty One, blessed be He, you gave me a vision long before I got married that Jacob would have 12 sons. I've already got six. Each of the two concubines has got two each. I'm pregnant now again. Now, if I have another son, that means Rachel can only ever, ever tops have one son, which would make her less than a concubine. That can't happen. Right? So you've got to start. Basically, what she does, she reminds God, right, that he's given promises. And so the Midrash is trying to say, look, She's a nice girl too, okay? She deserves the, to have the lineage of the Messiah. And then they also notice that um, all of the other ladies have a hey in their name, but Rachel doesn't. And what's a hey in Hebrew? It's the Spirit of God. So they're having a slight little, little dig at Rachel as well and saying, hey, she's not that spiritual, okay? Remember, she held, held on to the idols of Laban. Right, it's not that. So they they sort of make up this idea that she actually had to work through some stuff before she ends up uh, finally getting pregnant and, and produces Benjamin. Excellent. Let's have King Saul and uh, and all kinds of all kinds of stuff. So um, uh, uh, though they have a tomb for her and and you have you have you have to go visit her tomb if you're Orthodox, I think uh, twice a year. I might even be three times a year. They do it, seem to do it quite a lot. <clears throat> But Leah is the one that produces Messiah. Don't ever, ever, ever cast your, your eyes away from women who you might not think are the real, the, the real loved ones. God, God really does care for them very much. So the, the Haftarah portion for uh, for Vayetze is Hosea, and uh, Hosea is one of those interesting little prophets where um, he's prophesying at a time period where initially he comes onto the scene the same time as Amos and, and uh, where, where Israel, it was flourishing. It was militarily quite successful, although the Assyrian encroachment was beginning and uh, economically vibrant. <clears throat> but spiritually bankrupt, and uh, and and so they begin to 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 prophesy. Uh, he in verse it's it's eleven seven to twelve fourteen. This is actually the Sephardi um, tradition. The Ashkenazis do twelve. Um, it starts with my people are determined to turn from me. Isn't that a terrible thing for a prophet to say? Right? You know, that uh, he shows up into the people who are supposedly worshiping the Lord and says, uh, You're determined to not 
follow me. You have uh, you've set your your intention completely against what I'm supposed to be doing. Even though you call me God Most High, okay? so there's you have faith. You call God, God, but then there's no no putting it into practice. So on your lips, you're saying the truth, but in your practice and inside your heart, you're going in opposite directions. And uh, how can I give up on you, Ephraim? That's an interesting thing for, for God to say. How can I hand you over Israel? Ephraim and Israel now become paired. Out of all the tribes, Ephraim is the one that uh, God starts to use through the prophets. Now, I wonder why he would do that. Let's also talk about that uh, when we have our discussion. Why is Ephraim the stick? The two, two sticks, right? Ephraim and Judah. Why, why is that? What, what, what is it? Um, I, in terms of what the hill territory of Ephraim, um, today it's in what we would they call the West Bank. Uh, it's got uh, one of my favorite places to take people whenever you come here. Shiloh, right? Shiloh is in Ephraim. And uh, what is Shiloh? That's the place where God lived for 369 years. God lived in Ephraim and God lived in Judah. I have a tend I have a suspicion that that might be the reason why those those places get get marked out as something something special. There were it was also a capital, a regional capital, and um, it was one of the last tribes to withstand the the Assyrian invasion. Okay, so it could have something just straight down the line, politically archaeologically relevant. But in terms of like spirituality, um, I have a suspicion. This is personally that it's because of a. Uh, of uh, Shiloh or Shiloh. Uh, so, can I give up on you? Well, that's a good question. Can God do that? Is it possible? We'll think about that one. Okay. That's, a, that's a really good question for the prophet to actually ask, for God himself to ask. Is it possible for me to, to change my mind? Is it possible for me to break my promises? Is it possible for me to relent? Where, where, where do we go with that? That's a good question for our prophet. Okay. How do I want to treat you like Adma or Zeboim? Now, these were, these were villages that were close to Sodom and Gomorrah. So this is, uh, this is you know, God is saying, can I treat you the way I treated Sodom and Gomorrah? Really? Can I totally destroy them like I did in, the day, in, in Abraham's day? Uh, my heart is changed within me. Oh, what does that mean? First of all, God has a heart. That's always nice. Okay. Uh, remember, he's also got a soul. And uh, But where is he doing his thinking? In Jewish tradition, you don't think in your head. You think in your heart. Like, where is my thinking? Can I think differently uh, about you? I will not carry out my fierce anger. God, so so the, the 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 warning and the prophecy is I'm going to destroy you because you're so bad, and then God's having an internal discussion with Himself: Can I actually do that? Can I actually carry through what I'm saying? Uh, what an interesting thing for the prophet to 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 declare for God to reveal within within His prophet. I will not carry out my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim, for I am God and I am not a man. Right? I am the holy, the holy one among you. I will not come against their cities, even though they deserve it. Right? I'll praise the Lord that He would have the, the same mercy on us. Okay, uh, they will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion, and when He roars, the children will tremble before Him, and uh, they will come from Egypt trembling like sparrows from Assyria, fluttering like doves. So you're getting this, this um, it's actually quite, it's quite, it, it's a little bit of prophecy that there, there, there is this, an, an idea of a return uh, uh, from dispersion um, already. It's, it's, it's subtle, but, uh, but it's there. Ephraim has surrounded me with lies. 
Israel with the seat of the prophet goes back into um, his condemnation of Israel. Have you noticed that the prophetic voice is usually quite um, self-critical? Okay, um, you know, people go, the, the 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 prophets really do rage against uh, themselves. Uh, uh, and Judah is unruly against God. Um, even against the faithful holy ones. So Judah's not perfect either. Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind all day. Right? The, uh, the, the imagery there is quite, uh, quite clear. What, um, the, the, uh, what do people long for and look for? Nothing. They're chasing something that's empty. It produces absolutely nothing. Um, and that's exactly what our culture, is is enticing us to do it's um you know um where we're in our consumerism we're told to buy and buy and have black friday and cyber monday and taco tuesday and you name a day you got some special sale but it and, and we're told to go and get it at, at, but it, at the end of the day it all that ever does is well one it loads up your credit card uh but you're still not happy because there'll be another sale that you need to get. And there never seems to be an end. And, um, and that's what they're doing. They're trying to feed on, on and pursue this, this uh, system, the wind. And there's nothing there. The, the, the world system is a, it's essentially a lie. We, we claim justice but n never get it. You know, we, we claim equality and never achieve it. We, we want... Um, uh, to celebrate a unity, but all we ever do is disunite uh, our, ourselves. And um, what else do they do? Uh, they pursue the wind. They multiply their lies and violence. Okay, they make treaties with Assyria and Egypt. They're enemies. Okay, that's uh, one thing that the world does: is they make um, treaties with uh, with enemies. Of course, what are we we doing? We can, you cannot make a treaty with Hamas. Okay, it's just not possible. And how's that going to play out in the next couple of months? Here we shall shall see. But uh, the Lord has a charge to bring against Judah. He'll punish Jacob, uh, and will pay him according to his deeds. What an interesting thing to say. So what did uh, happen to Jacob? He was deceived. Nadar, Kenegan, Nadar. And so um, Israel, all of us, reap what we sow. Yes, they have the protection from the Lord. That is true. I'm not going to, to uh, deny that. But like any government, if you try and make deals with the bad guys, it will come back to bite you. Okay, and uh, so Israel is. This is now modern day Israel. Does need to be to be careful who they um try and uh, ally with, because it'd be repaid according to your deeds. Okay, and it, when you get to Revelation, what uh, when God opens the books in heaven, what does He uh, judge us on? What you've done. Okay, that does have relevance does have relevance. Okay? The things that we do on the planet do last. They last for things here and they last for generations. He struggled with an angel, right? Which is a, a reference to our Torah portion where God uh, uh, struggled with, with, with Jacob. And I carry around with me a little black folder. But inside my little black folder, uh, I have a picture which uh, I happen to, as you know, kind of like icons. Does everyone see who this is? It's Jacob wrestling with an angel. Okay, and there's a little hand uh, off to the side up here. And God's sort of coming out of heaven. Um, now, why why is this really good? Well, if you remember, uh, there's a Jewish believer called Idan. 
that works at Christchurch. He's in charge of the Heritage Center. So he gave a lecture. And uh, actually, uh, we, we, we did it together. We did a tour together, Idan and I. Um, we took a group of Israelis uh, and around uh, around the old city, looking at Protestant buildings. But instead of talking about Protestant buildings, the subject was the faith of Protestants. Okay? Why do Protestants do what they do? Not what did they do? They built hospitals. They built schools. That, but why did they do it? Okay? And um, and at the beginning of the lecture. Idan pulled this picture up and he said, this is actually, this is Protestantism in a nutshell, right? Jacob wrestling with God. Why? Because he's on his own. Right? You have to wrestle with God on your own. You, gotta, you can't do it with dad, right? You got you got to wrestle with it. You have to wrestle with God one on one. And he says, and that he said that's the one of the big core things for for Protestant Christianity is you and Jesus. You have to have your relationship with Jesus. He says we we have it in in the Hebrew Scriptures. You have to wrestle with God on your own. Yes, you're part of a nation, absolutely. Yes, you're part of a people, absolutely. Yes, you're part of something bigger. Than yourself absolutely is not the prayers that jesus teaches us our father forgive us our sins give us our daily bread not me myself and i but ours but also there is that one wrestling that you've got to have uh with 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 the angel with god himself and um so it's a very interesting poignant thing so i, I keep it around with me all the time so whenever i open my folder i go oh yeah that's right but I make sure that I'm wrestling with God properly, and how's my hip? But uh, the um, I think that's a very interesting thing that the the um, again it's one little verse that the that the that the uh, rabbis sort of then use that and connect that to the Torah portion. And what's the what's the prophetic voice constantly telling them? Get yourselves fixed up. Right, and, uh, our priests aren't very good. They're teaching us poorly. We've got a faith where we say we believe in God, but we don't practice what we really should. Judgment is coming. Let's repent. So there's this uh, constant call. Uh, this is seen in in um, still practiced in older traditions. Um, there are those that uh, will come to the older churches and go, "Why do these guys keep?" constantly confessing my goodness why are they always repenting uh because that's actually the voice of the prophets um uh, that's the the prophetic voice is get yourself right with with the lord and uh and return to the lord and maintain love and justice that's that's the uh, the way this this portion uh, begins to finish off it says return to the lord so return shuv teshuvah repent how by maintaining love and justice, okay? And so um, part of the, the prophetic call for us all is to turn around and um, as part of our repentance, um, enjoy love and justice. Now, what is justice? Right? Like modern day justice, well, they're so confused with what real justice is. Um, and... Uh, uh, but we can talk about that one as well. And in fact, why don't we start to do that? A couple of things we should 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 should, should discuss. Jacob and Esau. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, uh, and uh, um, and returning to to the Lord. But what and to, for God to ask us to love justice. But what is justice? Right. The the, the world's justice is it, is probably not the same as God's justice. Um, in Deuteronomy, the, Moses says, everything God does is justice. So all of his actions are justice, not just justice. So let's, let's discuss that. So unmute yourselves, brothers and sisters, and let's have um, a chat.
Well, I was thinking about um, Esau have I, no, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Just thinking about how God says that he disciplines those he loves, because we were talking in there about um, God, well, disciplining Jacob. And so it's not that he doesn't discipline Esau, but he's paying a lot of attention to Jacob. And so, I don't know, <laughs> is disciplining him even more so. So that's what, that was, was, that's what kind of came to me as we were talking about it. Yeah. So, so when you, when just, just we've got that verse out, Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated. What is it about that, that, that verse that really that unsettles us, that makes us want to smooth out the problem, because that's what rabbis do. Okay? Rabbis do that. They, they find verses in the Bible and go, oh, this is really a real problem here. Let's figure out how it works. Let's bring in other verses. Let's square the circle, so to speak. Well, I don't think that we like God to have preference in the same way that people... Right don't think that God should have any distinction by preferring the Jewish people. Right. Yeah. So we don't, we don't want to allow him that because it somehow makes us feel that we are that. What do you think, guys? Yeah, I kind of agree with that. I was thinking, uh, you know, it goes down through our own lens of abandonment issues, you know, because if we, if that is true, then it's possible that God will abandon me. So there's an element of fear. Element fear of fear in there. Okay. Nice. Fear. Um, another one, another one too, uh, you know, generally in the world, uh, we're trying to make everything equal, which is yeah. democratic, I guess. And, and so no doubt that is happening in the kingdom kingdom of god too where it's not it's a king who reigns and we are his subjects and so we are not equal even jesus said uh, that i didn't consider myself equal with my father and i said so, so i think that plays itself out too is we don't like that uh, harshness uh, that a king we we haven't really lived under a kingship to see how a king would operate actually we've only lived under a democracy and so we would maybe play that out as in the kingdom of heaven too hmm. what is the end of the jacob and esau story <clears throat> we get we get it, we got the beginning bit right where um jacob deceives his brother his brother's really angry fair enough okay and uh jacob has to flee and uh, he gets his angelic encounter his wrestling and 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 all the mess that that shows up, and then when um, when he returns, he returns with this, you know, huge number of kids, lots of money. What happens? He he fears he fears uh, Esau and sends forth gifts and yep and softens him and is you know still fearful that he'd get murdered by esau yeah he is he's always fearful jacob is a character who's always gripped by fear and um, often one of the uh, uh texts when it's when it talks about jacob um very closely after mentioning the name jacob it says and he was afraid he's constantly afraid and he's afraid of esau he's afraid that Esau is going to come and kill him, and uh, but Terry puts in his in his uh, little remarks. They make amends. That is true. Um, uh, they hug. Remember, they hug and they kiss and they weep and they make they make amends. And and that's also the story of Isaac and Ishmael. Is they also reconcile, and so often we we've, we've got this sort of idea that you know. Um, uh, Isaac and Ishmael are clashing, and Jacob and Esau are clashing, and it's sort of the tale that's that's sort of still going through the Bible. And so, well, actually, uh, yeah, they, it's a dysfunctional families, absolutely. But in the end, they got back together, and um, um, you don't need to use those 
those pictures to try and describe what's going on today. So it's much more simple than that. There's this bad guy and he hates God and he hates everything about God and he's trying to fight God and he's and he's causing all kinds of problems. It's it's it's, it's satanic. Is uh, is what it is. Can I just ask a question here? Um, right at the beginning of the toll boat, verse twenty-two, um, mm -hmm. where where uh, Rebecca says, you know, because of what's happening within her, if this is so, when the why am I this way? Like why why is this happening? Is there a sense of God knowing actually? how Esau is going to be in the future in terms of his, how, what sort of, like like how much free will does Esau have in terms of what, what ah, he does? Ah, that's a oh, good question. Yeah, um, that's, that's a good question. Because so Jacob, so, so Rachel recognizes something's wrong. And she's pregnant before, so she doesn't really, I mean, what is this? I mean, she... Right. Yeah, and then I, I like the way she goes to inquire of God. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So, and she goes somewhere. Like the, the the text doesn't say where, just as mm -hmm. she went. She, he she, he left. she she walked somewhere to inquire of the Lord. Did she inquire of the Lord through a priest? Like you know, who who is this? Um, uh, it's a good question. I don't know. It's like um, Hannah. Goes goes to inquire of the Lord, but but she physically has a nice place to go. She has to go into the tabernacle and mm -hmm. uh, and and inquire. But um, so so she has a definitely a sense of God now, better than than any idols of Laban. Um, and uh, but she gets and God talks to her, mm -hmm. right? So you end up with this this which which hasn't happened before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're getting you're getting this uh, you know these divine voices. You know we often sometimes think you know God spoke to these people all the time, um, and that might have happened, but the text doesn't imply that. Right? Um, and uh, you know if you if you asked me, um, uh, I felt something wrong, so I went and talked to God, and He gave me an answer. Guess what I would do. Every two single time I had something wrong, I'd go talk to God, right? You know, <laughs> that actually was physically happening. It was like, oh, my word, this is brilliant. I'm going to go talk to the divine one. You know, are you going to talk to your husband? Absolutely not. What does he know? I'm going to go talk to God, right? Um, so uh, there, there's something very special going on. She knows something's not quite right, and she has to approach God, which is not something she would normally do in she might love the Lord, she might worship the Lord, she might accompany her husband to worship the Lord, etc., etc., even though they still haven't had the Torah yet, so there's no um, set process for how you do this or where you do this. Um, but, uh, but there you go. She makes this inquiry, and she is rewarded with an answer. And, uh, and, uh, but the answer is so strange, isn't it? The 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 uh, the older one will serve the younger one, you know, which is everything's upside down. Mm -hmm. but, uh, straight away, like, what are you talking about? Uh, it's just just the way it's going to be. The one that comes out first won't be as as powerful as the other one. Mm -hmm. So prophetic, God's sovereignty, yes. Um, you could, if you want to put your Calvin, Calvinistic hat on, you know, go totally, total predestination. No one's got any uh, say in the matter, which of course would then mean that you can't ascribe anybody blame because that's the, the slight, small problem with hyper-Calvinism is, well, then no one's really got a choice. If there's no free choice, you can't really assign blame to someone. Um, but anyway, that's a, that's for Christian theologians to deal with. Jewish people don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What do you think about the prophetic voice always being very self-critical? 
They're deliberately choosing. I mean, obviously, they're making choices in connections to what they find in the prophets that to attach them to the to the Torah portion, right? Um, and, but but the 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 prophetic voice is quite critical, right? It's to, you know the pro the prophets are coming and saying, "Hey, you're priests. You're not doing your job. Um, uh, smarten up." Um, so. I wonder if there's any of those today. Because I remember when um, Ovaji Yosef, does anyone know who he was? He was the uh, one of the chief rabbis of Jerusalem. We have two. We have an Ashkenazi one and a Sephardi one. Okay. Uh, well, the Sephardi one, um, uh, his name was Ovaji Yosef. And uh, he used to say, make proclamations, they all make proclamations. Uh, he would make proclamations and he would usually, he was like St. Peter, okay? He would always put his foot in it. Um, uh, and unfortunately, he once said something really dumb. He said um, that the six million Jews who were murdered in the Holocaust were paying for sins of past lives. And, you know, you, you sort of go, what? And you know, I sort of kind of waited for somebody to chastise him, but no one did. You know, they just let these guys say stuff, and you sort of sit there and you go, "How? How are people letting them get away with it?" Okay, but do you know what? We do the same. We do the same in the Christian world, right? You know, you hear these people come on, they say dumb stuff, and, and instead of saying no, that's actually completely against the Bible, sacred history, the future. You pick one. Um, you should probably resign your position. Uh, they they somehow stay in power. But anyway, God sends his prophets. He warns his people. He really would like his priests to obey the Lord. <laughs> Any thoughts on Leia? Uh, it seems, you know, right away. Uh, well, I just want to... Talk a little bit about your question there. That um, it's the prophets are always negative. So right away, my mind goes, okay, where was the time when God spoke positively? Um, and the first thing that came to my mind is Mary, where the angel came and said, "You are highly favored." Like how awesome is that? So yeah. you know, we kind of focus on the negative as as people, but it's not about negative or positive. It's what is needful at the time, right? If we need a kick in the butt, then God will give it to us. If we need an encouragement, you know, God to say, come on, step up, get, get out of the yeah, that's nice. The, mm -hmm. the well and look to the light, like whatever we need, right? Yep. That's right. God in the in the in the prophets, God says, uh, I loved you, right? Before he chastises them. He gives you I you I love you. So he does give that that positive bit, but he also uh, you're right. Gives them what they needed, which was a um, a little bit of a rebuke. He doesn't shy away, shy away from that. But he does couch it in in uh, in letting them know how much he's cared, right. which is good. Yeah, that's the key. That's how he lets us know he loves us. He doesn't let us get away with anything, right? Like if you really <laughs> love someone, you'll tell the truth. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, we hope so. Yes. <laughs> what do you think of Leia? Because honestly, she is the one that produces the Messiah. And, and, uh, and yet she's the girl that is constantly missed. Um, I mean, she's in the, it's, she's in Jewish prayers. You, you, you do pray, you know, may God render you like, uh, Rachel, Rebecca, Sarah, and Leah. You actually put her name in there, so that's um, so she's there. But uh, there's no special day for her. You don't have. She has a tomb. The tomb is in the Machpelah. Okay, you actually in, in Hebron. Um, she doesn't have her own special one like Rachel does. But uh, and you don't make pilgrimage to, to her. I mean, you go to the Machpelah on a pilgrimage, but not deliberately to her to her place. I um. Yeah, sometimes think, gosh, the the overlooked one. 
is uh, is often the one that uh, that carries through the divine plan. Yeah, isn't that really what you know? God's plan is so amazing about. Hmm. We just kind of flit around the top, but His purposes and plan is a whole lot deeper. And sometimes those are the things that we just kind of miss. So I think Leia might be that sort of picture. Yep. Yep. Could be. And Isaac, you know, four chapters, hardly anything happens. But his faithfulness at the Akida, you know, you can't stop talking about him. And uh, he never changes his name. He never leaves the land of Israel. He only has one wife. He never tries to get other concubines and mess stuff up. Um, uh, he's tricked by his own kids, but that's really not his fault, right? Um, in, in terms of, he, he didn't mean to bless uh, Jacob more than, than, than Esau, okay? But, uh, so it's not, not his fault. Per se, so he he has a, a a very he has a very um limited career in terms of the Bible, but you know it's very powerful. The the diligent man who uh, obeyed obeyed his father and uh, was rewarded with a lady, nice lady, and uh, took a while. To, for kids to come along, but got there in the end. He doesn't seem to have like this massive highlight, but if you don't have him, you know, that's a, uh, you know, you, you, the story stops. So. I've never really thought of it before, but there's a bit of, oh, sorry, Melody. There's a bit of sort of humility there that he didn't ask for his name to be changed because it was sort of, Laughter, yeah, you know, carrying this name, but hadn't really thought of it before. You know, we don't know. We know that he likes good game. We know that he likes good food. <laughs> yeah, he's not a vegetarian. Okay. Uh, so, so, yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to say about all the um, the matriarchs. Uh, just thinking of. Sarai and uh, Rebecca and Rachel, how they all had to wait for their children. And just thinking of how they would have had this great longing and uh, love for their children, um, that perhaps God needed that in them to, to place uh, just that uniqueness and specialness for the children that they do have, because they, they aren't many. You know, and I just think of that even with people in our day who have had trouble having children that they just not that we don't appreciate them, you know, when we, you know, when we have them when, they, when they're younger, but when you have to wait so long for a child that you've almost sorted out how you're going to raise that child by that time and you've matured a lot more and, you know, you can just uh, have a better chance at raising them well. Mm. Uh, Aaron, just on that, um, back to that it, real quickly on that reap what you sow. Um, when you were speaking about that, I was just wondering about this current situation and the timeline in a sense is, um, is Israel careful of that sort of wisdom? Oh, that's a good question. So there's, we're having a discussion, you know, at the moment because we have a ceasefire. Is this the right thing to do? Is it the wrong thing to do? Um, what do we do about hostages? Because we haven't found any um, prior to, to, to yesterday. Um, in what Damaris mentioned in the chat there is, is quite interesting. Most of the people who were killed on October the 7th were all the peaceniks. Right. So these were the these were the people who went down to the south, which is Israel proper. It's not they're not settlements. It's Israel, Israel. And they lived deliberately lived close to the Arabs, right next door, 
because they wanted to farm the land and w work with them and grow them. And, you know, they, you know, a lot of the people who come from like Shalom Akshav, Peace Now and things like that, they, they all had all had their headquarters down there and they're all dead. And all the serious Kitsune guys, all the fundamentalists, all the hilltop warriors, they're living in the West Bank on top of hills, throwing rocks at Palestinians, being all kinds of nasty. And yet and they're the ones that didn't die. And it's very interesting, you know, like what happened here. Um, so there's a lot of people doing some soul searching at the moment. Within within the within the the Jewish world, um, so what have we got here? I'm just looking at the uh, current Israeli headlines. Uh, it looks like Hamas are playing um, a messy game, and um, the security cabinet's going to meet. Uh, okay, this hopefully does not. Uh, it could stop. Um, our little visit with our boys tomorrow. Ah, uh, dang it! I don't even know how I feel about that. There's got that old tension thing going on here. There's um, there's that you know, it'd be nice to see Micah, and then there's the other side. You can just kill them and come back. You know, but uh, there's that the real tension. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Sorry, I too cause disturbing thoughts. I, I just remember that, you know, one of the best ways that I felt I would pray is just that the Israeli forces would find the hostages themselves, <laughs> but they didn't have to be pushed to that particular yes. decision, which unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. So I have no idea why Hamas would be delaying, like what would they possibly achieve from this? I mean, they've had one day's respite. They can't possibly have regrouped their forces in one day. I mean, no, but Aaron, apparently they wanted all the food to go north into Gaza City. And Israel is saying no. The f and that's the reason they're delaying. Well, the so a, a private plane arrived a short while ago from Qatar to continue negotiating with Jerusalem. Oh, yeah, yeah. But the statement from the military is if the hostages aren't released by midnight Jerusalem time, that the IDF will go back into Gaza and continue. Well, the IDF's already in Gaza still. They no, they've, they've just, they've just rotated their soldiers. And, and Right, no, but they'll continue the war. Yeah. The ceasefire will be over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is going to happen anyway, but I mean that's you know it it this this whole ceasefire thing is is it's very strange, um, you know it's like, you know England and Germany during World War Two, you know, you know Hitler and and Churchill saying let's let's stop for a week. What do you think? Uh, everything good? Yeah, and um, we'll start fighting again in a week. Is that good with everyone? Um, it's kind of. Yeah, we should probably stop recording. How do I do that?